It was an honor to do it, and I loved it. It was a great story, and I'd love to do you some did more. You a great job as well. Oh, thank you very much. It really mm -hmm. was good fun. This is bollocks, Sarge, Max said. Why are we jumping in the dark? We're out in the middle of nowhere. It's not like anybody's going to see us coming. Captain John Banks smiled. Mac was always the first to complain. You could set your watch by it. It was a small bit of normality on a night where the normal was too far away. They cruised in darkness at 15,000 feet, somewhere to the west of Baffin Island, silent running through the Canadian skies. Twelve hours ago, Banks was ready for a spot of leave. He even had a ticket booked on a flight to Greece with his wife and both kids, excited, packed, and raring to go. Instead, he'd driven them to the airport to see them off, before reporting to base at the urgent request of the colonel. Now where he was headed was going to be a tad colder. At least he had his own hand-picked men with him, but it had been the only choice he'd been given. There's a Russian boat out there somewhere where she shouldn't be, John, the colonel had said back in Lossiemouth that afternoon, and we think it's in trouble. Maybe big trouble, if the sketchy report we have is to be believed. There might be something worth salvaging, though, and it'd be nice to know what they were doing snooping about so deep in Canadian waters. It's the usual deal for your team. Get in quick, have a shufty, and report back and don't get dead in the process. So now Banks, his sergeant, Frank Hind, and the small squad of four men he trusted more than anyone else in the world were out in the middle of nowhere, as Mac put it, getting ready to fall out of the sky into the cold black below. All in all, I'd rather be in Greece. Coming up on drop point, two minutes, the pilot said over the tannoy. Okay, Sarge, line them up. William Meikle, how are you? I'm good, actually. Uh, uh, summer's finally arrived here in Newfoundland. Uh, it take, takes its time getting here, uh, but uh, this week it's got hot. So we're up into the 80s this week, so it's, it's nice and warm. Right, and the more observant viewers would notice that you don't have a Newfoundland accent. No, <laughs> uh, I've been here for... We came over in 2007, so I've been here for 15 years now, but I've never lost my Scottish accent. And I spent why did... 10 years at I spent what? 10 years in London in the past and never lost my Scottish accent either. So. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, I lived in New Zealand and Australia for a long time and met lots of Scots, and they don't tend to lose it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it doesn't no. matter where they are or how long they're there. No. And, uh, even, uh, even being married to an English woman hasn't helped. <laughs> really? Yeah. So did you move from London to Nova Scotia or from Scotland? Uh, no. Uh, let's just see. I, left, I went to university in Glasgow. From there, I went to London. So I spent the 80s in London. I was in London from 81 through to 91. Yeah. And then I went back up to Scotland for a while. I was back up there until 2007. And then from there, I came over here. Um, my job at Edinburgh went tits up in 2007. And uh, basically, we made a decision to... I was just beginning to start making pro story sales then. And I made a decision to make a leap and try and write full time. So I came right. over here, bought a wee house in the shore, and uh, tried to write full time. It's going well so far. I haven't starved yet. So. Why has it paid off? According to Ginger Nuts of Horror, you're Scotland's greatest horror writer. <laughs> so Jim says, yeah. <laughs> Jim's been a good mate to me over the years, actually. He's reviewed a lot of my books. And uh, we first got in touch way back when uh, I was working in Edinburgh. And uh, my books were in Waterstones in Edinburgh, and Jim was going in and getting the signed copies for them. And uh, so Jim's been a, one of my staunchest supporters for almost all 15 years now, yeah, more than 15 years now. So you say you lived in Edinburgh, you went to university in Glasgow, so where's, where 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 did you grow up? Uh, a small town south of Glasgow called Kilburnley. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small steelworking town on the west coast. And the yeah. steelworks closed down. Steelworks closed down when I was 17. Just as I was going to university, the steelworks closed down. The, the place has been a bit uh, of an unemployment black hole since then. Right. Mum and Dad are still there. Mum and Dad yeah. are in their 86 they are now. They're still living in the same house they were when I was born. Brilliant. So was you, yeah. was one or, or both of your parents involved in the, in the industry of the town at the time? Then? My dad worked in the steelworks, yeah. He got made redundant uh, when I was 17. Luckily, he walked straight into another job, uh, so it didn't, it, it didn't cause him any great hardship. But the town's unemployment rate was 45% at one point. 
Yeah. It was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> but you went you went to university for a whole different life. Was that were you yeah. the first first of the uh, first generation to do that in your family then? First of my family, yeah, first generation. There's more of followed now, but I was the first of first of my family to go. Yeah. Everybody it's changed, isn't it? Because most people go to university these days. I remember at our school, um, I left school in nineteen eighty and there was a there was a plaque on the wall in the office and it listed all the kids that had gone to university from our school. Yeah. <laughs> and there was only about fourteen kids on that list. Yeah, there yeah. weren't that many for us. Uh until actually when we went comprehensive, uh which was when I was fourteen, uh the school went comprehensive and after that they started sending a lot more kids to university. But before that there hadn't been that many going. Uh but when I went there was five or six of us from the same class all went. And we all shared a flat together in Glasgow. Oh, brilliant. So brilliant. We had some good times in. <laughs> and what did you study? I studied botany. I started out doing zoology then switched yeah. into botany. I was uh, studying the ecology of peat bogs as they relate to archaeology. Yeah. Which is, uh, you can dig into peat bogs and find pollen grains from different levels of depths in the peat bog. And you can wow. date the peat bog. So you can date the peat, you can date the pollen, and you can find out what agriculture was going on at any particular point in history. Wow, so, so it I, leads I, into I history as well then. It wasn't, it wasn't strictly yeah, had, botany then. Yeah, no, well, pollen grains are botany, so it's, it's botanical yeah, archaeology. Yeah, but it's, but, it's, but it's also verging way into history there too. Yeah, history and archaeology as well. So it's a mixture, yeah. of, both, mixture of all three. Uh, so I had a chart going back 5,000 years of the history of this peat bog, and you can see the pollen, the, the trees declining and the cereal pollen coming in, so you can figure out when agriculture started in the area and stuff like that. It's all very interesting. Yes. Uh, I, tried to get a PhD. Yeah, I tried to get a PhD in that, but I couldn't get a grant for it. Right. Uh, so I ended up, I spent, moved into a, the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow after graduating and spent a year in there uh, cataloguing their plant fossil collection which also was a very interesting job. Uh, then I went to London to start another PhD, uh, which was in uh, apple trees, studying apple trees. Right. It's completely different. But that fell through after a couple of months, and I ended up falling into a job in IT in London. I was, I was lucky there, actually, because my grant for the PhD was about two grand a year at the time, which was back in 1981. And the job in the IT department in London that I got an interview and got into was six grand a year at the time. So I tripled my salary in a month, <laughs> within, a, within a month. But once I was in that, into IT, I couldn't get back out again. So I spent the next 25 years in IT building banking systems for uh, guys in flash suits mainly. Well, that would have been an exciting time to get into it because that's when it really all started taking off, wasn't it? It's when you had yeah, Sinclair was, uh... and Alan Sugar and all the rest of it trying to bring computers t to home. But in the world of banking and finance and, well, well, in everything, it was all starting to go that way. See, so you were, you were right, riding yeah, a, just... a bit of a wave, I would have thought. It was just as, a, just as personal computing was coming in and just as people were starting to get uh, the machines on their desks rather than having to send stuff off, send the papers off for somebody else to process. So there's an awful lot of putting desktop systems in for people and an awful lot of training people into how to work computers because a lot of people didn't know about then. Uh, and I spent most of my time actually, an awful lot of my time actually in customer support, managing support teams. So I was going out to visit banks and finding out all the problems they had with their systems and trying to solve them for them. So uh, I spent 10 years doing that in London and then another... 15 years doing that back in Scotland. Right. And how has any of that, because everything's got to be an influence. As a writer, you've got to soak everything up yeah. and then it comes pouring out of you. Yeah. How, the computing... Can you put your finger on anything specifically that helped you become Scotland's greatest horror writer? Uh, no, not really. Just my background. Uh, there's a lot of the science stuff uh, from my from the botany degree uh has come out of my writing, but not much of the computing. Uh, but my influences, I'm a very, very pulpy writer. Uh, my influences are all stuff like, uh, well, when I was growing up, it was Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and stuff like that. And then it, was, then it became things like Star Trek and the Time Tunnel and all of those things. But I always had a, always loved Hammer Horror movies and the 1950s big bug films like Them and... Uh, the, the giant mantis and all that kind of stuff. Oh, so the giant ants about, and all that, yeah. yeah and Twilight Zone and, had, a, had a bit of that, didn't it? And the Outer Limits yeah. and some of that stuff. So too. That's, I've always been, always loved monsters. 
But, uh, <laughs> Ray Harryhausen back in the sixties was a big influence on me. All those oh, he's motion. the guy that did Jason and the Argonauts and all that yeah, stop right. motion stuff. Yeah, and all those stop motion movies that he did. He did, he did a whole slew of stop motion horror uh, monster movies. In the 50s and early 60s. Yeah. And uh, they were always a big influence because I saw all of them when I was really young and they, they sort of got into me, into my psyche. And that's that's where a lot of the Esquad stuff comes from. It comes out of that. They're a mixture of that and uh, reading Alison McLean books as a kid as well, I think. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot of Alison McLean's soldiering stuff comes out in the Esquad as well. Yeah. Where he goes yes. there is another favourite film. <laughs> where, where he goes there, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So... Infestation. I don't want to give too much away, but it's it's about a troop of guys who happen to be Scotsmen, yeah. and they go on a mission and they find something that they weren't expecting to find. They find yeah. th there's something comes up from the sea, and and that their their mission becomes one of survival eventually. So it yeah. really is, you know, it's edge of the seat stuff, and it never lets up. It just goes bang, 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 bang. That's now, the pulp thing again. <laughs> it's, well, some writers would would think that pulp was was maybe not a a. Well, they might think it's a, a massive criticism. How do you feel about? Well, yeah, that I get that. I do get that from, from some people. I get criticised for it for, for being too pulpy, basically. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, and that's, that's not my problem. It's their problem as a reader, not my problem as a writer. <laughs> right. So you don't mind the being labelled as, as a writer of pulp? Oh no, no, no! I love it. Oh great, great, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Because this one, I, I, I tell you, I embrace what, it. <laughs> I tell you what, at first attracted me to this is is you know because I auditioned, I had to audition first with because it's Severed Press who 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 put the book out yeah. and they've got some great titles and I know you've done a lot of stuff with them and they they obviously put it out to narrators to do the audio book and for me the thing that attracted me was just the first line of the audition which turns out to be either the first line or very early on in the book and it's just this is bollocks Sarge and I yeah. thought oh yeah <laughs> I'm gonna audition for that one you know because yeah. just that first opening line sets up the the dynamic of the troop that you you get they're about to parachute out of the back of a plane and and mm. just the whole thing from the audition was like yeah i like the way this is all set up the, other, the other place that all came from was uh, i don't know if you've ever seen dog soldiers the werewolf movie no no there's a there's a movie a werewolf movie set in scotland uh, right. and there's a troop of soldiers who get lost in the scottish woods and end up having to stave off a, a horde of werewolves and the banter between all the soldiers and that is very similar to the banter between my guys right. and this one. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a bit of an influence on me. Okay. And is that is that banter influenced on something that you had experiences of maybe growing up in Scotland? Yeah, it's, it's the way all the people in my hometown talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a, one of the sergeants in the book, Sergeant Frank Hind. Uh -huh, I've got yeah. an uncle who was right. Frank Hind, and he was yeah. a sergeant. So I based right. it on him. He, he died a while back, but this is a little, little tribute to him, basically. He is, was in the is, army as well. Is Mac based on anybody in particular? Because he was my favourite out of all of them. Yeah, no, he's just a just a Glaswegian. I know <laughs> typical Glaswegian that I I would know. I knew a lot of people like then. Yeah, uh, but I mean, a, but a heroic native, native and, and loyal. I mean, he's not a bomb by yeah. any means, but he is. Uh, he, he's got his own way of doing things and his own way yeah. of looking at stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a a lot of my, my time in Glasgow, uh, Glaswegians have got their own rhythm. You know, you've, you've probably met a few Glaswegians. They've got their own way of speaking and their own rhythm of speaking. And uh, a lot of that comes out of my writing as well. So I like, uh, that fits the way I think, I think. Yeah. Has your writing changed since you moved to Newfoundland, do you think? Uh, I'm still writing Scottish stories, but I'm also writing Newfoundland books now as well. You are? So, yeah, I've got half a dozen books set here in Newfoundland yeah. now. The, right. the rhythm of speech here is completely different. The, this area in particular is all Irish uh, descent, uh, but they've, all, they've kept a very old style Irish accent, so the 18th century Irish accent from where they first, all first came over here. So it's a very, very uh, heavily accented voice. I had a lot of trouble with it when I first got here. And there's still a few old men, that, a few of the old people here that I never understand, just uh, nod your head and smile. <laughs> Well, I looked up Newfoundland on the internet, and one of the first things that came up was Newfie jokes. Are you familiar with these? Yeah, yeah the, a lot of the rest of Canada looked down on Newfoundlanders as the sort of poor relations of 
Right. The rich city folks. We're the Newfoundland scene is like the country bumpkin area of Canada. It's right. like Cornwall is. It's like Cornwall is to England in some places. <laughs> there, there was one. The, the one that I remember was is a bloke calls nine one one, and his his wife has died, and so they say, uh, you, uh, "Where is she?" And he, he says, uh, "She's at home here on Eucalyptus Drive," and the operator says, "Can you spell that?" And he, there's a big pause, and then he says, "Tell you what, I'll drag her over to Oak Street. You can pick her up." <laughs> <laughs> does does um is is there any truth in that stereotype? Uh, no, or is it the, unfair? The, the, I think it's the accent that that, that, that makes people think because it, it's, it's such a heavily accented uh, way of speaking they've got here. It's completely different to the metropolitan people in Toronto or Vancouver or got a very smoothed out Canadian accent, which is almost an American accent. Yeah. But Newfoundland have got this voice all of their own and it's, it sort of marks them out as different. So you mentioned when you were growing up, you were influenced by movies, Hammer Horror. You're talking about the Jason and the Argonauts stuff and all that. What's the stop motion guy's name again? Ray Harryhausen. Ray Harryhausen. Okay, yeah. so that so it was all that. So it sounds like you were influenced more by well, uh, to a great degree, by stuff that's very visual, like movies, yeah, my, rather than the written word on the page. Visual. Yeah, I think I think uh, the way I think is visual. I always wo- always watch movies, and I always the way I write, I think it, it would make a good movie. Yes, well, I'm making bias, but I think they make a good movie. No, I'd be great, but, uh, great, great movie. And also, I've also read an awful lot of horror over the years as well, because I grew up as a grew up as an avid reader. Spent a long time with my granddad when I was yeah. young. Uh, he yeah. was housebound, and yeah. he was reading pulp paperbacks. Uh, so that's where the Arthur McLean thing came from. But also, lots of crime paperbacks, lots of old science fiction, and lots of westerns. And he was reading books, and I was picking them up and reading them as well. So I grew up reading pulp by uh, mass in, ma- in mass quantities, huge quantities. At the same time, my mom was taking me down the library every couple of days, and I was getting three books every two days at the public library. So I was a, I was a voracious reader as a kid. Um, right. Yeah. Reading everything from I read the, I remember reading The Hobbit when I was about nine, and Lord of the Rings when I was about eleven. Uh, I got through all the Arthur C. Clarke and, Arthur and Isaac Asimov books when I was about 12. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so all the Alistair McLean stuff I read. And when was about, what, 13, I think? 13, yeah, about 13, I discovered H.P. Lovecraft's books. And that sort of led me into the horror side then. But before that, it was all science fiction and thrillers. Right, uh, yeah. Around about 13, mid early 70s in Britain, there was a huge paperback boom of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, Michael Moorcock in particular was bringing out a paperback every three weeks or so. Uh, I had a huge collection of Michael Moorcock paperbacks back then, uh, about 40 of them, I think. Uh, still got most of them, and he was another big influence. So when was it you decided, I'm going to I'm gonna write? When did you actually start, not professionally, when did you actually start getting some I was too busy. Down? In the 80s in London, I was too busy getting drunk and enjoying myself mainly. Uh <laughs> But uh, in the early 90s, when I moved back to Scotland, uh, I realised that my job was a bit boring, the new job in Scotland, and I needed something else to do. And uh, I'd always, back in the 70s at school, I was was writing song lyrics and playing guitars, and uh, I'd never actually written written two short stories, I think, back then, and nobody liked them, so I didn't bother again. But by 1990, I saw an advert in the paper for a ghost story competition, and I thought... I wonder if I could write a ghost story. So I did. I tried it and I sent it, sent the sent it away to the competition and actually got a second prize, one hundred quid. So that was my first story. And I thought, oh, this is easy. I can do this. So you were you were a professional from the start. You were getting paid yeah, from the I, beginning. I had no idea how much rejection was going to fall though. But uh, that first one uh, was a good a good first one to have, and that's that's how that gave me the impetus to keep going because I knew I could do it. Basically. Yeah, yeah. You just I spent need a long don't... time after that writing just writing short stories in the British small press. For small press magazines, spent most of the nineties just writing, just writing for peanuts. Basically, it was only in the early two thousands I started thinking maybe I should do more about this, and uh, started sending work out to better paying markets and larger publishers, and it sort of snowballed very quickly after that. I think I was stuck in the small press, not thinking, not realizing I could do any better for a while. 
So when you wanted to make that that leap to to novel sized books, and yeah. Infestation is not a long book; it's about the right length as an audio book. I think it came in under five hours. Yeah, they're, which, they are quite short. I mean, I've, I've written some much longer books, over, but these ones uh, go fast. At, it's about forty thousand words, I think. So they're fast reads, and I think that's that's the best sort of length for me to work in. Especially now as I'm getting older, I don't have the don't have the uh, concentration to write huge big novels. So did you start getting a publishing deal with a big uh, publisher, or was it indie published to start? All indie publishing. Everything. All indie. So far, everything's so far has been indie publishing, apart from the shorts. I've had I've had short stories in big mass market magazines. Yeah. Uh, like the. Uh, Nature, you know the uh, scientific journal, Nature. Okay, yeah, they, yeah. They publish short stories in the back of them every month, and I've sold yeah. half a dozen to them, and they pay right. really well for, for just they pay very good word rates for very short stories, basically. So you can right. bang out a short story and get paid a lot of money for it. Uh, and a couple of the big American glossy magazines have sold stories to as well, but mostly right. I sell to uh, say what they call independent presses. Yeah. Right. There's so is that what is that what Severed market. Press is? is? Would Severed Press be counted as an indie? They're counted as an indie. Yeah, they're not. They're not counted as a major press. Uh, but they're good enough for me. I mean, I've made. I've been making quite a lot, large amount of money out of these Sesquad books the past couple of years. Yeah. I've certainly made enough to pay for this house out of them. Great, great. And so, what difference then has it made the the, the growth of ebooks and then now audio books? Yeah, the, the ebooks is where the money the money really started rolling in in two thousand and ten when ebooks took off for me. Yeah, uh, I found a I found a niche in the ebook place. The first ebook I published was uh, a pulp science fiction thing called Invasion, and uh, it sold twenty thousand copies in, in the first month when it went to Kindle, uh, and that was a in big one month. Over. Wow. One month, yeah, and that was a big eye opener for me. I was thinking, this is a, this is a game changer for, <laughs> for my money and for, for for me going forward. And since then, has the Kindle's been keeping me in in money basically for the past fifteen years, thirteen years now. Yeah. And is, have, is audiobook starting to go that way yet, or has it still got a bit of a way? Uh, the audiobooks haven't zoomed in, zoomed off for for money wise. The sales are steady, but it's not astronomical. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so, the amount that you put out was that was that deliberate? Did you go look? I'm just gonna I'm gonna blitz it because there are some people. You know, there's somebody said to me, I forget who it was. They said, you know, you'll you'll meet writers and they just they don't put that much out. You know, and they said something like, some people write and some people wait. And the people who write are writers, and the people who wait That's are right. waiters. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm definitely a writer. It's just, I don't I mean I don't feel as if I'm pushing it that far. That fast, but just a, a thousand words a day works out an awful lot of books. How many oh, books would you put out in a year then? Uh, well, now it's down to it's about four or five. Okay, at the right. uh, it was up as much as nine or ten back in about t- five years ago, but I've slowed down a bit as I got a bit older. Yeah, and what's a typical day like for you? A typical writing day? Uh, I just sit. Sit with my laptop and write, basically. <laughs> so you get out of bed straight onto the laptop, first thing you do? Uh, I'll have my breakfast usually, yeah, but after that I'm on the laptop most of the morning and most of the afternoon, then I sit at night time just sit and watch films. Okay, right, so you don't, you don't, yeah, so that's, you'll well, we get, get a thousand it. words out every day? Yeah, most days, yeah. I mean, uh, we get seven months of winter here, so I'm in the house most of the time for those seven months. <laughs> right. Uh, but the rest of during the summer, I'm out now about a bit more. Don't do, as, don't do as much writing, but in the winters, there's not much else to do. Right? <laughs> so why did you move there to Newfoundland? Because you could have moved oh, anywhere well, in the world. You're a writer, so you don't you yeah, don't need yeah, to be close to uh, work. Well, I wanted a, I wanted a house on the shore. Right. That was, that was the first thing because I always loved uh, being on the shore, being near the sea. Yeah. Uh, and. I'll tell you the truth. We sold the house in Scotland for two hundred grand. Yeah. And we bought this one for twenty. Well, that would be a big uh, influence, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you get uh, to live by the sea. And it's a four-bedroom house on the shore with a great sea view. Yeah. And it's yeah. Only, it was only twenty forty thousand Canadian dollars. It was. And how did you get through like the the immigration rules or whatever? Is can you work there? Oh, or... uh, yeah. You can, as a Brit, you can come over here for six months. Yeah. Uh, on a or residency of the visa, just yeah. just by being a member of the Commonwealth. Right. And once you get one, uh, applied for permanent residency, uh, it costs us a couple of hundred bucks, but we became permanent residents. And that's it. We're here. Every five years, we have to get a new e-card, but that's it. 
and I can also now apply for Canadian. I can apply for Canadian citizenship if I want to. That would mean giving up my British citizenship. So I don't know why you do that yet. Oh, do you have to give up your British citizenship to get this? Yeah, uh, it, it 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 complicates the tax laws as well. If I do, if I become a Canadian resident, uh, a Canadian citizen, because yeah. uh, my pensions from the IT jobs are getting paid back in Britain. Right, I see. So yeah. Being a British citizen is much better for that situation because because that I can't get the British pension companies to pay me over in Canada. They pay me into a British bank and I have to transfer them me over here. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, but having, having that pension, though, that would have been a nice cushion that would have helped you make the decision yeah, to go full-time. Yeah, it kicked in last year. Yeah, yeah, just kicked in last year, so, uh, but I knew it was coming. So. Yeah, no, I've got I've got three nationalities. I I was born in Britain, so I've got a British passport, but uh, my parents emigrated to New Zealand when I was 18, and they came home when I was 21, and they never went back, and they're not allowed back in now because everything right. expired. But I stayed, and I took out New Zealand citizenship, and with my New Zealand passport, I walked into Australia because you don't need any work permits or visas there. Yeah. And I just went and uh, I lived in Australia for nearly seven years. And then uh, luckily, my wife, her parents are Welsh, so she could get a British passport yeah. by, because of that. And she was born in New Zealand. She's a New Zealander, so she got the New Zealand. So we both had the same passports when we got into New Zealand. And then we both took out Australian citizenship when we were yeah. there because I was worried about them changing the rules and didn't want to get kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, uh, um, but I've kept all three up to date. But funnily enough, I've uh, I've lost my New Zealand passport at the moment because I renewed my British one and they've brought in a new thing because I've renewed it before, but they brought in a new thing where they said, if you've got citizenship of another country, we want to see the passport. So I had to send yeah. them my New Zealand one. Well, they sent me with a new British one back, but they haven't sent the New Zealand one back yet. So. God, it's lost in the system somewhere. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, so it does get, it does get complicated. And it, yeah. it, it, for me, it confuses the hell out of Americans. If I travel to New Zealand or Australia via the US, yeah. I mean, I always like to arrive in New Zealand or Australia on the local passport because you can go in yeah. a shorter queue <laughs> when you <laughs> arrive. So I will, I will leave... You know, I'll show a British passport as I leave Britain and then I'll, but I might have the American visa in the British one and I'll enter America on the the American visa in the British passport. But then I'll arrive in New Zealand or Australia on the New Zealand or Australian one. And then if I go back through America, they get really funny because they think I've jumped ship on the visa thing, the, yeah. the Etsy thing. It's just, it does get so messy. You should really only travel on one. But the thing is to go to Australia and New Zealand, I need a visa, but I don't as a citizen. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you've probably done the right thing. If you can live there and just renew a thing every five years, that sounds like the way to go. Yeah. That sounds like the way Definitely to do it. Do it. We, we, uh, we found a place because we came over on holiday. Uh, the, it's a whale watching hotspot. Wow, so we came, nice. over, came over here to watch whales uh, for a holiday and we fell in love with the area from there. Right. So was was the sea life being so close and off the coast, was that an inspiration for the monsters in investigation yes, there? It, 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 was yes. it? Also, my first summer here, I spent a year out on the boats, the whale watching boats as a guide. All oh, right. So, uh, taking taking tourists on about so I was out seeing whales every day for, for that whole first summer. Wow. Which, which, what kind of way? The closest I've been, I saw, I was in Iceland and I went on a whale watching boat. Yeah. And I think it was humpback whales, but I might have that yeah, wrong. Yeah, we've got, we've got sperm whales here, we've got humpbacks, we've got uh, right whales, and we've got uh, lots of dolphins, we've got orcas as well. Wow. And uh, fin whales we've got as well. I think there's six different kinds of whale we could see on any particular day we were out. Um, if you're lucky got, enough and they yeah. come out the water like that with the tail comes out and it's just yeah, there's something up close and personal with a lot of them but one trying to come into their dinghy at one point <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well that kind of that's kind of what happens in Esquad except it's not a whale it's yeah, uh, right. <laughs> something, far, something far more sinister uh, than that well, a, lot of yeah. sea, a lot of that sea stuff comes out in the Esquad books uh, and I live in a fishing town so there's a lot of fishing stuff fishing boats and stuff so right. we're around. We see boats going in there all day, every day as well, from the front window. So, right. So the infestation is the first in the Esquad series. How yeah. many's in the series now? Uh, number fourteen came out wow. last month, <laughs> wow. and I've got a contract from Esquad to write number fifteen. Still, wow. so I'm still going. <laughs> wow, that's great. 
And what about the main character, Captain John Banks? Where does he come he's from? He's still here. He, he's, he's, he's still he's, doing he's, all right? He, he survived all the way through, yeah. Uh, a yeah. couple of the other ones have either retired. Some people have been killed off. Some have been retired, injured. And some well, have, I, uh, I don't, there's gone. a spoiler here, and I'm not going to give it away, but there's uh, one of the squad... Uh, gets into some real trouble in infestation, and I was I was quite sad. Yeah, <laughs> what happened to him? So I don't I don't want to give anything away, but uh, yeah, you don't know who's going to make it out to you don't know who's going to make it to the end of the book, which is great. No, and, no, that, and that's I think, one of the things I like I like about writing about writing them. I don't want to keep the same guys all the time. I want to switch them about a bit, but just have the, the main the same main characters. Yeah, the, the, the lower level characters I like to switch around a bit. Right, and and Captain John Banks, where does the influence for him come from? Where's the inspiration? Because uh, he's again, a good leader, isn't he? Yeah, I think I think it's from watching things like Zulu and Where Eagles Dare and British war films of the sixties. It's, it's that kind of character. He's that kind of guy. Yeah, he's the, the square jawed, uh, no nonsense guy, basically that holds everything together. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a bit like I don't know if this is an insult, but it's the the whole book is a bit like Alien meets Jaws for me. Yeah, the the second Alien film, the the, the one with the uh, Marines, the Space Marines, that's yeah. another influence as well because there's a similar kind of vibe to it to to what's going on in some of the infestation book. You mentioned Alistair MacLean, that's definitely there. Is is there? I I thought there might be a bit of Stephen King in there too. Would that uh, be fair? Yeah, King's always been an influence because he's been one of my favourite writers over the years, and his his style is something that I think is quite close to my own places. Yeah, it's I've very, also very, done. Uh, I've also done some audio books for a Scottish writer. Funnily enough, I don't know if you've heard of him. His name's Malcolm Archibald, and he's got no, a series really called done. Windrush, and it's about soldiers in uh, British soldiers, but they're mostly Scottish. Um, oh, I've seen the series. Yeah, I didn't like it. Yeah, the Windrush yeah. one. I've seen the series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've I've narrated a couple of those, and and that the camaraderie between the troops is very is very similar. And yeah. uh, the closest experience I had, like I told you, I lived in New Zealand. I worked on a construction site. I was a pipe fitter for three years, and uh, the the banter on the site was a bit like that as well. <laughs> you yeah, know? and it's just blokes, you know, young guys. A lot of Scots in New Zealand as well. <laughs> yeah, and well, there were a lot, a lot. There were a lot of Scots in. Uh, actually, it, a, it, I told you earlier, I come from Coburnley in yeah. Ayrshire. There's a town in New Zealand called Coburnley, which is, is founded there? by people from the from Coburnley. Whereabouts in New Zealand is it? I'm not sure. I just know it's in New Zealand. I'm not sure really. really where it's what, what, what always used to happen? There's 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 one lad who was a mate of mine, Peter Brown. He's from Paisley. And um, you, every no, that's, now and again, that's not far from where I'm from. <laughs> right, yeah, it's near Glasgow, isn't it? So yeah. um, we would go out. We're in our twenties, like you know, and all the Brits would hang together. And, you know, the guys who worked at the refinery, this construction job, and uh, we'd go out drinking. And eventually, we might get into some. For the most part, we got everybody got on, but now and again, there might be some tension, especially when we were first there between the Brits and the local New Zealand lads. Um, yeah. And uh, sooner or later, one of them would, would, would have a go at us and start calling us poms. And it was always Peter and the other Scotsman, another Scotsman we used to drink with, Whiskey John. They would always stand up and go, I'm not a pom, we're Scottish. Pom is, <laughs> is uh, prisoner of Mother England. And they always yeah. had that as a comeback that, you know, confused the Kiwis. <laughs> the way that the Scots stick together, it's something special. It really is. Yeah. So did you have anything to do with the the turning of Infestation into an audio book then, or were you hands off? Yeah, no. Uh, Gary at Sever Press just asked me if I, if I was okay with it being an audio book, and I said, yeah, go ahead, because I've got lots of other audio books out. From, yes, uh, yeah, got, there are a few, yeah. Good person, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was, a, it was an honour to do it, and I loved it. It was a great story, and I'd love to yeah, do you some did audio. You a great stuff. job as well. Oh, thank you very much. It really <laughs> was good fun. And I tell you what, if, you, if you're watching this now on YouTube or wherever you're watching it, but specifically on YouTube, you want to get the audio book for free. If you just email me and say, and put free audio book in the subject line. If you do that, email me, graham at macmedia.co.uk. If you can't remember that, well, you can see my uh, website address is there, yeah. grahammac.com. If you go there, at the top and bottom of every page on that website is my email address. If you click on that, in fact, I'll put my email address in the blurb on YouTube. 
as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You go in there, uh, click on that, and put free audio book in the subject line. If you're one of the first 10 people to do that, I will send you a code that will let you download the book for free. And you're going to enjoy the book, and then you don't have to, but it'd be nice if you wrote a nice little comment and give us some stars on this on how much you enjoyed the audio book. So if you like that for free, just email me, graham at macmedia.co.uk. You'll find the email address. It's in the YouTube blurb. It's also on every page at the top and bottom of my website, grahammac.com. Uh, just put free audiobook in there. First 10 people to do that, I'll send you a code to get the book for free. You can download it from Audible. Uh, what's next for William Meikle? Uh, as I say, I've, I've got another Escort book to write. And yeah. I've also got a contract from Sever Press to start a new series uh, about people who hunt sea monsters. So it's a sea, back to the sea again. But it's going to be a different squad. It's not, they're not military. They're uh, dedicated monster hunters, these guys. Right. Uh, right. And uh, they, they, they hunt for money. So rich people who, who get into trouble at sea go to these guys to uh, get them out of trouble. Right, and they're, so they're, they're kind of bounty hunters, then, are they? They get the, yeah. This is the, yeah, we get a bounty for for killing monsters. And after them. <laughs> so this is, this is going to be interesting. So it's going to be a a, a mixed uh, group of people. There's going to be men and women amongst amongst the monster hunters, uh, and they're mostly stuck in a boat for the whole period of the story. So there's going to be a lot of tension between them all as well. So that's going to keep me, keep me interested for a bit. Uh, apart from that, as I say, I've slowed down a wee bit. Uh, I've got a new, I've got a side issue away from all the monster stuff where I write uh, Victoriana. So I've written a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, I've written some Professor Challenger stories. Who I've written some a lot of ghost stories in Victorian times. A lot of that came out of living in London because uh, most of them are set in London, but back in Victorian era. And I've got a collection of weird Inspector Lestrade cult stories coming out this year. Yeah. Uh, Lestrade was the cop that Sherlock Holmes was always butting heads with. Yeah. Uh, so I've given him a, put him up front to Sherlock at the back and given him a lot of ghost stories to deal with. And uh, I like these books because they come out from specialist publishers who do them in limited edition hardcover with colour illustrations inside. So they're really nicely produced bits of art, basically. Uh, I've got a whole shelf worth of them upstairs, which are all my stories in these really nice leather-bound hardback editions. So that makes me happy that, uh, as if well. If someone's someone watching this would like to get more info about the, the stuff that you do, have you got a website or somewhere you can send them? Yeah, uh, it's an easy one, williammeekle.com. Williammeekle.com. I'll put a link to that in the blurb as well. Yeah. If you missed that, you'll be able to click on that and go yeah. straight to that and find out what William's up to. William, it's a pleasure to meet you, and thank you very much for allowing me to, to narrate infestation it's a cracking book it's a cracking read and continued yeah. sex success thanks again thanks for having me and uh, maybe gary will come to you for doing the next ones in the series as well yeah i'd love to i'd love to yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have a word with gary <laughs> excellent thank you very much thank you very much graham thanks Cheers. for having me